Romans 10 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You and I right now, we need God's faith in our life. In this season, in this time of history, we need faith in God, don't we? So let's pray right now and welcome God's precious Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that Jesus came, died on the cross to save our lives, and he's resurrected, and he is administrating our help, our hope, and he has the Holy Spirit on assignment right now to unfold, to teach us the word of God, to unfold God's treasure map for us so that we can see the great redemptive plans that God Almighty has for our lives. Even in this time of history, we receive the good plans of God for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One day, a little boy was overheard. He was praying, and he said, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't you worry about it. Not at all. I'm having a real good time just like I am. <laughs> Look, whether you're having a real good time just as you are, or you're having the most difficult time of your life, I want you to know something. God has great redemptive plans for your life. He's the redeemer and God has amazing plans for your life, but it's going to be by faith. So let's right now launch into this segment, part three of No Fear Here. No fear here. What a great message from God's word that he's implanting in our heart. No fear here. It's essential. In parts one and two of No Fear Here, we learned about the Hebrew definition of the English word for fear. The word picture interprets it as the hand you see. The hand you see will be the hand that you're in awe of. Do you see God's hand as the awesome source of life, protection, help, hope, and courage? Or do you see the enemy's awful hand, a fist to shame, hurt, punish, steal, kill, and destroy. In this part three of No Fear Here, we're going to zone in on this topic. Giants always talk. That's right. Giants always talk. Recently, a beautiful young woman named Tasha, she was told that she had brain cancer. She and her husband were expecting their second baby and were 20 weeks into her pregnancy. Now, she had three doctors at the foot of her bed telling her that she needed to have an abortion and start chemotherapy. Giants always talk. Tasha, she didn't deny the feeling that she was scared at the voice of the fear. She felt scared, but she held on to hope. She said that she had many deep conversations with Jesus in the hospital, and she knew that if she held on to the Lord and his promises, that he would keep her baby safe. Fear talks, but faith in God talks louder. It talks better. It talks stronger. In the face of the fight for her life, Tasha gave birth to a very healthy, beautiful little baby girl named Gracie. Tasha said she's grateful that her dad taught her to always, always put her trust in Jesus. Look, God tells us to fear not or be anxious for nothing. In one way or another, over 365 times, the Bible tells us to fear not. You know what? That's enough for fearless living every day of an entire year. But did you know that fear's always been a major obstacle to creativity, to peace, to progress, to health, to innovation? World influencers, inventors, and leaders have repeatedly identified, guess what? Fear, fear as the major obstacle. Henry Ford, the great American industrialist, he once said this, one of the greatest discoveries a man makes is to find he can do what he was afraid he couldn't do. Babe Ruth, the pro baseball legend, said, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. How about Rosa Parks, an icon in the civil rights movement? She said, I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing, how very little can be done under the spirit of fear, she said. 
Florence was a bold, caring influencer in the 1800s at a time of terrible wars and great need. Right now, in this moment, it's critical for you and I to understand this in overcoming fear. If you change your thinking, you will change how you feel. Your feelings, get this, your feelings follow your thinking. Well, do you want to change how you feel? You must change your thinking. You must. You know, most people have turned down great opportunities just because of how they feel. If you try to change your feelings, you will spend a lifetime running from your thinking. So for example, if you feel afraid, if you feel scared, then you know your thinking is meditating on fear, on scared. Feelings follow your mindset. Simply put, behavior follows belief. Behavior follows belief. If you're going to live a good life, you must have good thinking. The enemy knows this, and so he wages a war against your mind. You guessed it. His number one weapon of choice? Fear. A mental construct. That's what fear is. It's a mental construct. Fearful thinking is common thinking. Fearless thinking is uncommon thinking. Fear shows up like a giant, big, ugly, scary, armed with weapons, dark medicine, and yep, talking trash. Giants always talk. They talk trash. Whether it's Hitler, a terrorist, a deadly disease, whether it's poverty, an abusive husband, or a terrible storm, fear giants talk. Fear always talks trash. Then those fear words build a mental construct on the inside of you that controls and manipulates and tortures you from the inside out. Think for a moment about the famous David and Goliath showdown. You know that story. In 1 Samuel 17, we have the famous story of the nation Israel facing the cruel Philistine nation. They sent out their champion Goliath. The Philistines sent out Goliath every day for 40 days, taunting, intimidating Israel. Everyone is terrified until a shepherd boy, David, shows up with a slingshot and some words of faith. Well, what happens when 10 feet of ugly, towering terror meets a small, faith-talking teenager? Tell me what happens. Well, David runs at Mr. Giant in the name of the Lord, and he defeats him. Yes, he kills the big, hairy giant. You see, giants talk, but faith talks bigger better. Faith in God talks with overcoming authority. Most people miss the real point of this story. It's not so much about killing giants as it is about defeating the giant fear, overcoming the terror produced when giants talk, because they do talk. So where does this tormenting mental construct called fear come from? Where did it originate? You see, we can learn so much about something when we trace its origin or first mention in the Bible. So where do we first hear about fear? This is important to know. If we go way back in the book of Genesis, the very beginning, God has just created everything and then he makes it all, all the animals and Adam gets to name them. Then God causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam and God takes a rib from his side, and he forms this beautiful woman, Eve. Now we have this super cool couple living in the Garden of Eden. They're happy. They're a little bit naked, sure, but there's no shame, no fear. They're naked and unafraid, right? Genesis 3, verses 1, and then we'll go to verses 8 through 10. Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? You see, they could eat from all but just one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent said, you know what? If you eat of this tree, you'll be like God. Remember, they were already made in the image of God, but the serpent's now tempting Eve. You'll be like God. He's got that end justifies the means kind of thing going on. So what did they do? They disobeyed. They ate the fruit. They sinned. And suddenly they had this knowledge that they were naked. And what immediately followed the deceit? They felt ashamed, uncovered and ashamed. So let's hit verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
So the man and his wife hid and kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord God. Look at that word right there. Presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Just a little side note for you. You understand that Psalm 1611 says, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. They were hiding themselves from their fullness of joy. Crazy. Verse nine, but the Lord God called to Adam and he said, where are you? Adam replied and he said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. I was afraid because I was naked. Adam says, I was afraid because I was uncovered. I was vulnerable. And so I was very ashamed. You see, they traded good thinking for bad thinking. They allowed a mental construct based on a deceit, a lie. For the first time in humanity, we see self-protection kick in to cover up or to layer, to reduce the vulnerability. But it has a cruel side effect. It also costs them the very presence of God, the source of life. Substitutions and counterfeits will always cost you the presence of God. They are anti-Christ. Here's the bottom line. A lie was believed in the garden. Fear took over and now it reigns. Counterfeits are pursued to relieve the pain. Think of it. They put leaves on themselves. They substituted leaves for the very presence of God, the glory of God. So from the Garden of Eden all the way to this present day, let me show you how this unfolds in a person's life. It goes from lies, from deception, it gives birth to fear, and the fear then causes us to make an evil alliance or an evil agreement. So let me give you a lie that's very typical. You're not loved. That's a typical lie. Then it leads to this fear, the fear of rejection and disapproval. And then you make an evil alliance with self-sabotage. People sabotage themselves. They get into control. They get into perfectionism. Let me go back again. Another lie. You can't do it. What's the fear? It's a fear of failure, a fear of losing, a fear of even trying, a fear of humiliation. And then what's the the evil alliance they make? Excuses, blame, injury, criticism. Let me give you another lie and deception. God rejects you. The Lord just rejects you. So then what's that give birth to? The fear is the fear of judgment, the fear of punishment. So then what's the evil agreement or alliance? They make an alliance with religion, with penance, with sickness even. Let me give you one more lie. Tragedy is coming upon you. That's the lie. Then what's it do? It gives a a fear of even living, a fear of hoping, a fear of making decisions. Indecisiveness takes over. And then what's the agreement? People end up making an agreement with despair, with disease. They make an agreement with suicidal thinking, destructive thinking. I know a wonderful Christian family in Minnesota, a couple, and they had a great son, an amazing athlete. He was such a handsome guy, very smart, accomplished at school. He was liked by everybody. He was that likable. Everybody loved this guy. A lie got into this kid's thinking. It was catastrophic thinking set in. It was a worry about his destiny. A sense of impending doom was allowed access to his life. He didn't know how to deal with the fear, the stress, the anxiety. So to counterbalance those feelings, he made an alliance, an agreement with a thought, a mental construct of self-destruction, of despair, of fatalism. His parents came home and found him hanging in their garage. He committed suicide. Worry comes from an old English word meaning to strangle, like a wolf does, to strangle. Many young people are feeling the deadly grip of worry and fear of the culture squeezing off any hope in their life. We all need a dose of God's truth to break the stranglehold of worry, and it works every time. Knowing the truth sets you free. Mark Twain said this. He said, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. That's true for a lot of people. If faith moves mountains, then fear metastasizes the problem, the mountain, the giant. Remember the acronym I gave you to better identify fear, F-E-A-R? Falsehood eclipsing all 
reality. Falsehood eclipsing all reality. The closer a falsehood gets to your eye, the more it becomes all you see and all you know. The talk of the fear giants often cause paralysis, an atrophying of life movement. Oh sure, there can be an immediate fight or flight reaction, but then it quickly turns into this cage of paralysis. Dale Carnegie, in referring to something like that, said this, inaction breeds doubt and fear. Action breeds confidence and courage. Claude Pepper said, life is like a bicycle. You don't fall off unless you stop pedaling. Joseph Campbell said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. I like that. The paralysis of life movement is the outcome of mental constructs built by fear. Remember Saul's army? They were paralyzed and trapped by imaginary steel bars of fear. Fear left unchecked in your life has the power to cage and then destroy you from the inside out. Fear can and will contaminate every part of your life. It spreads, it's viral, it's contagious. A common fear is the fear of failure and yet failure is not fatal. It's part of the journey to success. But the giant of fear says, quit, why don't you give up? Surrender and make an agreement with me. That's how Hitler's Nazi regime bullied and attacked Europe. Britain, on the other hand, would not surrender. They wouldn't agree or they wouldn't make any concession with the so-called giant talk. Winston Churchill, the prime minister of Britain during the World War II fight, he said this, fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. It's interesting, isn't it? God says in Deuteronomy, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Make a choice. You choose. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing. And yet Jesus warned his disciples and us too, beware or be cautious about lies and counterfeits of religious fearful thinking. The Pharisees used lies to control the people. It was a misrepresentation of God, just like the serpent in the Garden of Eden said to Eve, well, now has God really said that you shall not eat of that tree? Really, did he say that? Let's not forget for a second who the father of all falsehood is. John 8, Jesus said, the devil is a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. That's who the devil is. Satan is a murderer, a thief and a destroyer. He accomplishes his heinous acts by using his core resources, which are lies, deceit. The falsehood he spreads starts manifesting first in the form of fear, stress, worry, doubt. Then it crescendos the anxiety. He tortures and torments the human soul. Remember in the Garden of Eden, look where fear came in and contaminated beauty, perfection. In one single generation, a single lie turned into the fear of rejection. Then it turned into shame, jealousy, envy, and it landed with Cain murdering his brother Abel. Fear giants throw fear grenades into your thinking. The enemy can't stop you. Did you know that? Philippians 4 verse 13 says that you can do all things through Christ Jesus. Satan cannot stop you, but he can persuade you to doubt, to invert your faith, and quit trusting God. Norman Vincent Peale, the famous pastor and best-selling author, the motivational guy, he said, fear is never a reason for quitting. It is only an excuse. Excuses don't require faith, but trusting in God activates faith power. Let's face it. The devil's plan is simple. His strategy is to cause you to stop you. He wants you to stop you. He wants you working for him against you. Isn't that crazy? Feeding on fear, we fall for it though. No wonder Philippians 4 verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing. You allowing fear sabotages you. So Satan lobs these fear grenades. They release lies. They explode with toxic fear bombs that unsettle your mind. God doesn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's what 2 Timothy 1.7 says. Have you ever experienced something like this? You're having a great week. Like you're just feeling good. You're feeling confident. You're hopeful. Suddenly you get a phone call. Suddenly it's a text. 
a worried thought comes up in your mind, an angry look comes from somebody, doubt explodes in your head and in your heart, falsehood, falsehood eclipses all reality. Boom. It's that dangerous proximity of falsehood. Put your finger up to your eye right there. Put your finger up to your eye. It's not the biggest thing in the room, is it? But it looks like it is when it gets this close. Maybe it's only me, Pastor Stephen, getting these fear bombs dropped on me. Nope, it's very common. Well, how come I feel like I'm the only one? That's the devil's strategy, isolation. Divide and conquer, divide and conquer. Do you know how many people lay in bed trying to get some sleep, worried, fretting, agonizing over what to do, which way to go, what now, I don't know. Falsehood eclipsing all reality, F-E-A-R. It is said that most abused people would rather live in a known hell than in an unknown heaven. The enemy has tricked people into fearing the unknown, nothingness. Believe it. Nothingness has the ability to terrorize people. It's because F-E-A-R grenades blow up from the inside out with toxic thinking, toxic thoughts. So where's your covering, your protection? Who's your defense against giant trash talk? Because giants talk. Ever since the Garden of Eden, where humanity lost its covering, God has desired to shield us, to protect us. Look at Philippians 4 verse 7. And God's peace, which transcends all understanding, shall mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God saw our covering ripped away in the Garden of Eden, and now he sees our vulnerability, our need, and it may seem normal to us. It may even seem acceptable now because we're so used to it. But to God, it's unacceptable that you're unprotected. He wants you shielded, protected. He even wants to put his favor around you to protect you. To God, who is love, remember God is love, fear is unacceptable. We are not entitled to our own definition of love especially in the presence of truth, God's truth. Love never considers fear normal, acceptable, tolerable. Love expels fear. My friends, love never ever shows fear, concession, or any kind of understanding. When I was a boy, I spent a few summers out on lobster fishing boats on the Atlantic Ocean. I've seen big waves up close and personal. There were a few stormy days when the waves were so huge that when the boat was down in the trough between the 9 to 12 foot waves, it was nothing but a wall of ocean everywhere we looked. The ocean and the storm would shout their giant trash talk. And believe me, if you listened even for a second, it was terrifying. It was scary seeing these walls of water. Well, one day, Jesus and his disciples, they're going across the Sea of Galilee. And we pick up the story here in Matthew 8, verses 24 to 26. And suddenly, behold, there arose a violent storm on the sea so that the boat was being covered up by the waves but Jesus was asleep. <laughs> and his disciples came to him and they woke him and they said, Lord, save us, we perish. And Jesus said unto them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great and wonderful calm. Jesus is asleep. How about that? He's at rest in the eye of the storm. Get this, he cares and loves you but he doesn't esteem or care for fear. He ignores fear, trash talk. Love puts no value on the storm and yet love marvels that we do, that we would give ear to fear. Fear is simply faith in deception. Jamie Foxx, the award-winning actor and comedian said this, what's on the other side of fear? Nothing. Jesus' disciples said, don't you care that we're dying? Love doesn't give ear to fear, my friend. Love cares for you. Jesus, who is love, asks, why are you afraid? Love never normalizes fear. Love will never accept, normalize, or give ear to fear. You were designed to live fear-free. And whom the sun sets free, whom love sets free, let's say it that way, is free indeed. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear, 
is a spiritual problem that takes advantage of situational occurrences like storms, waves, bad news, pandemics, bills, doctor reports, enemy armies, and yes, even hairy, scary giants. But the answer always remains the same. It's God's answer to a spiritual problem. His gift of power, love, and of a sound mind. It's threefold. God's power, love, and a sound mind. His thoughts expressed through his word. Romans 10, 17 tells us, faith comes by hearing the word of God, not experiences. Faith doesn't come by events, but by God's word. Fear is evil. The giant throws lies that are evil, these evil bombs. So we resist them, how? With the shield of faith. Never make deals with fear. Don't sanction fear and make it out to be some hidden blessing from God. Some people are doing that. That may give you a temporary relief because we all want relief, but it entrenches the lie, the deception. You cannot make peace with fear and anxiety. They're not meant to keep you humble, my friend. That's garbage thinking. The enemy laughs at us when we adopt dysfunctional thinking like that. You don't learn from fear. Nobody learns from fear. Never take counsel from fear. Don't sanction fear 1,000 times no. Yes, fear giants always talk, but faith in God talks, and that talk slays giants. Say no to fear. Sing no to fear if you have to. You can be fearless and faith-filled, but open your mouth with words that are faith-filled. Philippians 4, verse 7, listen to this word of faith. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall mount a guard, a shield over your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Aren't you excited for that? God wants to guard to protect you, a guard over your heart and mind. Fear can't penetrate God's peace. Giants always talk. But thank God for his peace because his peace says no to fear. No fear here. Let's pray. Father God, we exercise the gift of your power, your love, that sound mind from Christ that you've given us. We resist the fear talk of the giants in life. We repent right now of all the agreements that we've made with fear talk just to ease the pain. We repent of that one forgive us. We lay down, we renounce all worry, anxiety, and every care here at the foot of the cross. In its place, we receive your love, your joy, your peace, Lord. Oh, what a protective layer that peace is. We receive your power, Lord. We have your word so that we have access to the mind of Christ. All in Jesus' name, Amen. Say that. Say amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.